All right, so we're going to begin chapter 19, which is all about blood. Now, for lab, the blood is in the second practical. Um, just so you know, endocrine and blood are spit, split in the practicals, but in the units, they're together. Chapter 18 and chapter 19 make a, a lecture unit. So I know you may feel like, why am I learning about blood now? It's going to be on your second practical exam for lab. So it doesn't hurt to kind of know it early, okay? All right. So let's get past learning. Okay, so we're about to start a unit that pretty much has three chapters um, in it. But like I said, we took the blood and put it with the endocrine system. And then we're going to put the heart and the vessels together in a second lecture unit. But they're kind of all related. They're all part of the cardiovascular system. So in order to have a cardiovascular system, we have to have the pump, which is the heart. We have to have all of the hoses that connect all the body parts, so those are the blood vessels, and we have to have something in it, and that's the blood. That's what we're pumping around. So blood is a fluid connective tissue, and we're going to discuss it in detail in Chapter 19. So it is made up of cells that are suspended in a fluid matrix. So it's a suspension, if you remember that definition from way back in Anatomy 1. So suspensions are mixtures that, if given time, have large particles that will settle down in the bottom. And so they have to be continually resuspended. Okay, so blood is a suspension. A good common example of a suspension would be Italian salad dressing. So if you go into the fridge and you get your salad dressing out right now, all the good stuff, all the seasonings and the garlic and all of those are sitting in the bottom of the bottle. So before you use that salad dressing, what are you going to do? You're going to shake it up. You're going to resuspend all of those things. And that is what makes it a suspension, okay? So in the blood, it's the same thing. We have lots of cells that if we give them time, they will settle down into the bottom of a tube if they're not moving. But most of the time, they're floating around in your bloodstream and they're constantly moving. Okay, so what do we do with blood? We use it to transport gases. We need oxygen and carbon dioxide to be transported. We need nutrients, hormones, and metabolic waste to be taken around the body from the cells to get rid of them or bringing things like nutrients to the cells. We need to regulate body pH and ion composition and the composition of interstitial fluids with the blood. We need to restrict fluid loss and injuries. We need to defend against toxins and pathogens, and we need to stabilize body temperature. All those are accomplished by blood. Now, blood is usually at 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. My body temperature is 98.6, right? Well, you're always measuring your body temperature either in your mouth or in your armpit or sometimes in the anus, right? So that's not directly in the blood. The blood is higher in temperature. It is 38 degrees Celsius. It is thick. Blood literally is thicker than water. It has a high viscosity due to albumin in the plasma and the cells. And it is slightly alkaline or basic. Its pH is between 7.35 to 7.45. It's the ideal pH range. You have about 7% uh, of your body weight in liters uh, of blood. So 7% of your body weight in kilograms would be how many liters of blood you have. So if you were a 165 pound person, you'd have about five and a quarter liters of blood. Now blood can be described as whole blood, which would be the matrix of blood, which is a straw or yellowish fluid called plasma. And all of the cells and, or what we call formed elements of the blood. So if they're all together, we call it whole blood. We're going to learn about what those cell fragments and cells are in a few minutes. Now, fractionation is when we separate the cells from the plasma. And we do that by spinning it in a centrifuge. The cells are heavier, and so they get taken to the bottom of the tube, and the plasma is the top layer. Plasma is a, a little more than half of the blood volume, about 55%. And most of plasma is water. But it has a lot of dissolved proteins that we're going to keep with uh, the same concentration pretty much as the fluid around cells. So it's similar composition to interstitial fluid. And we're going to pass things from the blood to the interstitial fluid and from the interstitial fluid into the blood. Okay, so here is a sample of whole blood, and after we spin it down, we will see that 
55% of it will be a yellowish fluid. That's called plasma. It's 7% protein, 1% other solutes, and 92% water. And then the formed elements, which will go to the bottom of the tube, is going to be made up of three different kinds of cells or pieces of cells. We have platelets, which are less than one-tenth of one percent. White blood cells, which is pretty much your entire immune system. Are you ready for this? Less than one-tenth of one percent. And 99.9% .9 of the cells and cell fragments are red blood cells. Okay, another term you will also hear of is hematocrit. So hematocrit is the percentage of formed elements in a sample of blood. So normal blood has, should have a hematocrit of about 45%, but in adult males it can be up to 46, and in adult females around 42. So 45 ends up being kind of like the average. In the plasma, 60% of the proteins are of a class called albumins. And they are going to help with the plasma osmolarity. That means keeping the concentration of proteins kind of close to what's in the interstitial fluid. We also use albumins as transport proteins and to transport fatty acids and thyroid hormones and steroid hormones. 35% of them are globulins in the plasma. And these are proteins that you might know as antibodies. They are called immunoglobulins. There's also transport globulins like hormone binding proteins, metalloproteins, and apolipoproteins. Okay, so we have albumins and globulins, and that brings us up to 95% of the proteins. And then the other 5% is made of 4% is fibrinogen, and just varying other ones make up the other 1%. But I want you to look at this fibrinogen. I told you in a previous uh, video that anytime you see ogen at the end of something, this is a protein that's made in a long form that is inactive and it gets cut by an enzyme. And once it gets cut, we remove the ogen from its name and that's the protein that becomes active. So this is an inactive protein in your plasma that once it gets activated by an enzyme becomes fibrin. And fibrin is a thread protein. And Fibrinogen stays dissolved in the plasma. Fibrin does not. Fibrin actually falls out of solution as a string. And this happens when you have blood clotting. So we're going to talk about that towards the end of the chapter. Okay, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool trick. Okay, so where do we get these plasma proteins? More than 90% of them are created in your liver. Your liver does something like 500 jobs in your body and making your plasma proteins is one of them. So it has to make all the albumins, all the fibrinogen, most of the globulins, and lots of proenzymes. Now a proenzyme is an inactive enzyme that usually gets activated by another enzyme. Okay, I know, don't get confused. Antibodies can also be made by plasma cells that are part of the immune system, and peptide hormones are made by endocrine organs. So. If they're in the plasma, they did not come from the liver. They came from plasma cells and endocrine organs. All right, so that's the liquid part, the matrix, the ground substance. Now we have the formed elements. Notice we don't have fibers in blood. Instead, we have formed elements, and they are called erythrocytes, leukocytes, and thrombocytes. You may have heard of them as red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. We're not gonna use those terms, even though they're here on the slide, we're gonna primarily use, try to use the proper terms, leukocytes for white blood cells, erythrocytes for red blood cells, thrombocytes for platelets, okay? Now to make these cells, we go through a process called hemopoiesis. So this is not homeostasis, this is it's not hemostasis, that's clotting, hemopoiesis. So this is what platelets kind of look like. They're known as thrombocytes, and they are actually pieces of a cell. They break off of a giant cell called a megakaryocyte. And we're going to use these little pieces of cells combining with the fibrin threads to create blood clots. White blood cells, or leukocytes, come in five varieties. Three of them have little spots in their cytoplasms known as granules. So these three are called granulocytes, and then the other two do not have a big noticeable, noticeable spots 
in their cytoplasm. And so they are called a granulocytes. The prefix a means without. Okay, in this chapter, you will need to know all of the individual kinds of white blood cells and what do they do in your body. And finally, erythrocytes or red blood cells are the most abundant and these are specialized cells that are used to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. All right, so let's start with those. So your red blood cells or erythrocytes. Again, 99.9% .9 of the deformed elements are these particular cells. And they are unique because they are containing a special pigment known as hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin goes back and forth in color depending on whether it is bound to oxygen or not. It is either a dark burgundy wine color if it does not have oxygen. It is never blue. Okay, it does not turn blue, it turns burgundy if it does not have oxygen. And when it is bound to oxygen, it turns bright fire engine red, the color you may associate with blood. And that hemoglobin is able to bind oxygen and it's able to bind carbon dioxide. Now in your body, you have between four and a half or 4.2 billion if you're a female to 6.3 million cells per microliter. A microliter is one one thousandth of a liter. It takes five microliters to make a drop. I know this because I used to measure things in microliters. Okay, that's a lot of red blood cells. Just think in one drop of blood, if it takes five microliters to make a drop, you would have somewhere between 27 and 32 million red blood cells. That's a lot of cells. Your hematocrit, also called your packed cell volume, again, is the percentage of formed elements in your blood. And we said it's usually around 45. That averages men and women. But for males, it's usually 46. And for females, it's usually 42. Okay, so when we're making an, a red blood cell, you notice it didn't look like any other cell you've ever seen. Instead, it kind of looks like a, a bagel or a donut with the middle hole filled in. Now they are biconcave, that means the upper and lower surfaces sink in, and the outer edge is thicker. So here's what they look like under a slide. The white in the middle just means that the, it's thinner in the center than it is on the edges, okay? Now, why is this? Well, along the development of a red blood cell, it loses its nucleus. So the part of the cytoplasm that used to, and the membrane that used to cover the nucleus kind of sinks in. That gives us more surface area for binding of oxygen to hemoglobin. So they're flat, rounded disks. Here they are in an electron scan microscopy. By the time we're a mature red blood cell, we've lost the nucleus, we can't reproduce. It's basically a bag of hemoglobin. There's not much left inside other than hemoglobin. Okay. So here's a diagram showing how it gets thin in the middle and it's thicker around the edge. Now this is a really cool shape because it allows these to bend and flex inside very, very tiny capillaries. Some of your capillaries are so narrow that the red blood cells either have to go through single file or may, may even have to fold in half. And so that allows for folding. So what is striking about this shape? It has a large surface area to volume ratio that gives us lots of areas for binding and releasing of oxygen. In your capillaries, they can form single file stacks called a rouleau. We're about to see a photomicrograph of that. And again, they bend and flex. So here is a stack or a rouleau of red blood cells heading toward through this one capillary. They all line up. So they are a nucleate when they're mature. That means they got rid of their nucleus. They don't have any mitochondria, which means they can't make energy. They can't propel themselves. They have no ribosomes, so they can't make proteins. They can't fix themselves. They can't grow. They can't divide. They can't change. And so once they become mature red blood cells, they are only circulated for about 120 days. By that point, which is again about four months, they are so badly beat up as a bag of hemoglobin that your body just retires them and recycles all of the contents that it can. So again, they're just a bag of this protein, hemoglobin. 
Normal hemoglobin is 14 to 18 grams per deciliter of whole blood in males, 12 to 16 grams per deciliter of whole blood in females. And it is a protein that has the highest level structure or quaternary structure. That means we build it in four pieces. There are two alpha pieces and two beta pieces. Each of those four pieces kit has a molecule of heme, and each heme can be held in place by one iron, and then each iron can bind 102 molecules. So a molecule of oxygen is two individual atoms of oxygen joined together. When the iron is holding on to an oxygen, we call this oxyhemoglobin. When the oxygen re is removed from the heme group, we call it deoxyhemoglobin, okay? So here are our four chains, two dark blue ones and two bright blue ones. This is our heme and the red dot in the middle is an iron, okay? The iron helps hold the structure together and that's where the oxygen is going to bind. Now, when a woman is pregnant, her baby makes a different kind of hemoglobin called fetal hemoglobin. And you may have heard of binding affinity. That's how strongly two molecules can interact with each other. Fetal hemoglobin has a stronger binding affinity for oxygen than mom's hemoglobin does. So what does that mean? As mom's oxygenated blood goes down into the placenta, baby strips off all the oxygen. Baby hogs all the oxygen. So mom is oxygen poor and that makes her tired. It's hard to create ATP without oxygen. So it's for the baby's good because baby can't breathe. Mom has to breathe deeper. Sometimes she has to breathe faster and she often feels exhausted. Okay, so each red blood cell, are you ready, has 280 million hemoglobins on it. And each red blood cell can carry over a billion oxygens. So out in your capillaries where oxygen is low, hemoglobin releases oxygen to the cells. And it more strongly binds CO2, which is a waste product that is made by the cells. So it drops off oxygen and picks up carbon dioxide. And then we call it, instead of deoxyhemoglobin, we call it, are you ready, carbaminohemoglobin. I just sounded like an intro to a Def Leppard song, sorry. And if you don't get that, that's okay, you're young. All right, at the lungs, where it has a lot of oxygen around it, it drops the CO2 and then picks up oxygen again. So then it has oxygen to take back to the cells, It'll drop off the oxygen at the cells, pick up CO2, take it back to the lungs. That's how our circulation works for the delivery of oxygen and the removal of CO2. Now, you may have heard of a condition called anemia. Uh, there are different kinds of anemia, but what anemia is, is a lack of oxygen delivery due to some lacking of the blood. Not circulation per se, but the actual binding of oxygen to the blood. So either our hematocrit is low or our hemoglobin content is low. 1% of our circulating red blood cells are replaced every day and about 3 million new red blood cells enter your bloodstream every second. You're very busy making red blood cells. So to make red blood cells, this is called erythropoiesis. Hopefully you figured out that poiesis is the formation of one of these blood cells. If it's erythro, it's for red cells. In embryos, the embryonic stem blood cells come from the bloodstream to the liver, spleen, thymus, and bone marrow. That's where we're gonna get them from. They differentiate first into stem cells, and then they divide to produce blood cells. In adults, we can only make new cells in myeloid tissue, which is red bone marrow, which is only in between flat bones and at the ends of long bones. We also have hemocytoblasts. This is what we call our hematopoietic stem cells. And there's two different lines of stem cells for blood. There's the myeloid and the lymphoid. The myeloids become all of your red blood cells and some of your white blood cells. And lymphoid only become lymphocytes, which is one of the five kinds of white blood cells. 
If you're a blood expert, you are called a hematologist. And they have gone through and decided all of the phases that a red blood cell goes through from stem cell to mature red blood cell. And these are the subphases. It comes, goes from myeloid stem cell, becomes a pro-erythroblast. Then it goes through several erythroblast stages. Then it becomes a reticulocyte. And it's at this point it gets released into the bloodstream. And then shortly after it's released as a reticulocyte, it matures into a red blood cell. So here we go. This is how many days it takes, I don't know, a little over a week. So we go from stem cell to pro-erythroblast, and then we have basophilic erythroblast, polychromophilic erythroblast, normoblast, we get rid of our nucleus, reticulocyte, go into the bloodstream, and then become an RBC. Now, I'm not going to test you on these individual phases, but you might want to just kind of have a general idea what happens. Okay. Now, a hormone that stimulates the production of more red blood cells is erythropoietin. We're going to hear more about this. We heard a little bit about it in the endocrine chapter. We're going to hear more about it in the urinary system because it is secreted by your kidneys. When your kidneys, who, who see your blood several times a day, detect that the amount of oxygen bound to your RBCs is low, then it stimulates your body to make more RBCs by secreting this hormone. And it sends this hormone to the bone marrow to be activating red blood cell production. Now, you may have heard of something called blood doping. This is when a, an athlete takes their own blood out, removes a lot of the red blood cells, which stimulates their body to make more red blood cells, and then goes and puts their original blood cells back into their bodies, hoping that they can actually bind more oxygen by having so much more hematocrit. This is dangerous because you are making your blood extra thick with red blood cells and you're just asking for trouble, blood clotting and, and problems with circulation and blood pressure. So not a good idea. In fact, it is illegal in Olympic sports and most regulated sports to perform blood doping. Erythropoiesis, in order to make red blood cells, we must have the right amino acids to build hemoglobin. We must have iron. We must have folic acid, which is one of our B vitamins. We must have vitamin B12 and B6. And if we're lacking B12, we get something called pernicious anemia. Okay, so what happens after that 120 days, your little red blood cell has been going around and it, it's kind of just not really a good bag of hemoglobin anymore? Well, it's time to recycle it. And so we have special cells called macrophages. They're amoeba-like white blood cells and they engulf these damaged red blood cells, and they are located in your spleen, in your liver, and in your red bone marrow. And what they do is, the first thing they do is they take the hemoglobin molecule off. They break the cell open, and they take the hemoglobins. And then they break the hemoglobin, and they keep the iron part, so that they can build new hemoglobins with the iron. The rest of the hemoglobin has to go through several steps to be removed from your body, okay? So, it gets processed by different parts of your liver, and it will go through stages from being red to being yellowish green, and eventually to brown. So, during hemoglobin recycling, if you're breaking down a lot of red blood cells, you may see something called hemoglobinuria, which is when your urine turns red or brown because you're breaking down a lot of red blood cells all of a sudden. Hematuria is if they see entire red blood cells in your urine, which should never happen unless you have a kidney stone or a broken blood vessel somewhere in your kidneys or ureters or bladder. Okay, so to break down the hemoglobin though, first we rip the, the iron off. Then once we take the iron off, it changes into something called biliverdin, which is a green pigment. And we take it from red to green, and then we convert it to an orange-yellow pigment called bilirubin. And this is then excreted by the liver into your bile. Now, if your liver's not working, then this yellow-orange bilirubin will begin to build up in body tissues, especially the whites of your eyes and under your tongue, and you will get a condition called jaundice. Now, if your liver is working, 
then it puts it into bile. Bile secreted into your intestines, which of course ends up in your colon eventually. And there are intestinal bacteria, which will take your bilirubin and use them to create urobilins and stercobilins. Urobilin makes your urine yellow and stercobilins make your poop brown. With very few exceptions, no matter what you eat, your urine is yellow and your poop is brown. And that's due to the breakdown products of hemoglobin. I like said on most circumstances, unless you like eat beets or something, then you might change the color. All right, so what do we do with the iron? We take the iron from the heme and we keep it in the phagocytic cell or release it in the bloodstream. In the bloodstream, it's got to be carried. So we, we bind it to a protein called transferrin. And then we take it back to new red blood cells that are forming and we make it, put it in a new hemoglobin. If you have too much transferrin, it's removed by the liver and spleen storing iron in ferritin and hemosiderin. And here's a little graphic for those. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this first video here and I will pick up with slide 45 in the next video.